you know, education is almost siloed, right? You have, you know, policymakers in one silo, you've got uh, education researchers uh, in another silo, and then you've got classroom teachers, you know, practitioners in a third silo. And there's, there's precious little interaction bet between those, uh, the, those three silos. They don't talk to each other. According to a study from the American Federation for Children, 78% of parents believe that they should have influence over what is taught in K through 12 classrooms while 71% wish they had a more significant role in creating the curriculum. How can school boards, teachers, and parents navigate the increasing polarization of K-12 education? What role should parents have in school curriculum? And how can parents and educators work together to provide a quality education for all students, regardless of background? This is what I want to know. And today I'm joined by Robert Pondicio to find out. Robert Pondicio is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he specializes in K-12 education, teaching, curriculum, and school choice. He became interested in education policy after teaching at an underfunded school in the South Bronx. Robert is a former journalist and has published several books, including How the Other Half Learns, Equality, Excellence, and The Battle Over School Choice. Today, he joins us to discuss the role of parents in their children's education inside and outside the classroom. Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. Nice to see you. Well, it's always good to see you. Um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, your work in the education space. Um, you know, and, and I know you and I've known you for years, but I actually didn't know that you taught in the South Bronx. That must have been an interesting experience back then. Yeah, it's um, it, it's kind of my accidental career in education, I guess, is how I would say it. I, I was coming home from work on a blue day and and I was um, seduced by an ad on the New York City subway system for for the teaching fellows. I'll, I'll never forget this. The, 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 the tagline on the ad was you remember your first grade teacher's name. Who will remember yours? Oh wow! I'd just become a dad. Um, I'd written a, a bunch of books for for young readers about the internet and online services. So everything just kept coming up education, and and as I say, you know, I, this ad caught me at the wrong moment. I'd been involved in, in the media world for twenty years. I was started to think, okay, what else should I be doing? And so the idea of of literally, Kevin, a two year mid career public service stint, you know, go teach uh, in 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 a, in a low performing school for a couple of years is kind of a give back phase of my career. It, it just kind of stuck. I did it, um, and then two years turned into five. Five years turned into a second career uh, in education. Now, when you saw that ad, you said you were going or coming from work. Where were you working at the time? Yeah, I was the uh, the communications director for Business Week magazine at the time. I'd, I'd had, a, again, a 20-year media career. Mm -hmm. I, I ended up teaching at what was literally uh, the lowest performing school in the lowest performing school district in New York City. So it was... You know, it was kind of a trial by fire, but also, you know, a front row seat for, um, you know, how we are educating the, the, the most disadvantaged kids in the country. And honestly, it made me kind of a literacy guy. I mean, you know, again, I was 40 years old or about to turn 40 when I started teaching. And I, you know, had not set foot in an elementary school since I'd been an elementary school student. So, you know, 20, more than 20 years. And, and, you know, I've described this trajectory as, as, you know, going from saying willing suspension of disbelief. In other words, the way I was being taught to teach reading to struggling readers just did not resemble anything I remembered from my own elementary school education. But I thought, well, you know, okay, it's been a while. What do I know? Um, that skepticism or that, that turned into skepticism. And, and then it kind of turned into militance and anger. Uh, in other words, you know, uh, I, I really, I learned mostly on my own uh, about uh, reading and literacy and discovered on my own the work of a guy named E.D. Hirsch Jr., whose name might be familiar to, to some of our listeners. Yeah, he, this was the guy who wrote Cultural Literacy, I think almost 40 years ago. And I've told this story so many times, Kevin. I mean, Hirsch was the one guy whose work described what I saw in that South Bronx classroom every single day. 
children who could decode a word I didn't know at the time, but like who could read out loud the, 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 the words on the page, but struggled with comprehension. And, you know, Hirsch was the guy who'd said, you know, look, it's background knowledge, it's vocabulary, it's language proficiency. The way I was being taught to teach reading to, to, to my fifth graders was, oh, it's about student engagement. You know, the curriculum doesn't reflect their experiences. They're not interested in it. And Hirsch was like, no, it's background knowledge. And, and whenever I would bring up Hirsch's work in, you know, professional development or my grad school classes or whatnot, almost in, invariably somebody would say, oh, that's that dead white guy stuff. Nobody takes that seriously. And I'd be like, wait, whoa, whoa, that's that's not what his work is about at all. It's about, you know, schema, background knowledge. You know, in other words, you know, we were doing nothing at all to prepare kids to read with comprehension. You know, education is almost siloed, right? You have, you know, policymakers in one silo. You've got uh, education researchers uh, in another silo. And then you've got classroom teachers, you know, practitioners in a third silo. And there's there's precious little interaction bet between those uh, th those three silos. They don't talk to each other. So I, you know, on my best days, I think I kind of, you know, fill the cracks in between that. Uh, and because I've been a teacher, um, I, I think that gives me, you know, not just the standing, but almost like a, a, um, a way of talking to teachers that helps, you know, explain policy to teachers and explain teachers to policy. I mean, the one thing I will say about, um, you know, the, the, the work that I did in the South Bronx as a teacher and becoming a Hirsch disciple, you know, the whole ed reform movement, which, you know, you were uh, obviously and are quite a big part of, that, that was really catching fire at about the same time I disappeared off into the South Bronx. And, and I remember being kind of stunned when I started setting foot in the education reform world after leaving the classroom, how agnostic, um, to pick one word, uh, policymakers were about classroom practice and how hostile um, teachers were to policymakers. And, you know, I was the guy who was like, like, look, you know, what happens in the classroom matters. I remember early on when I criticized charter schools, a handful of charter schools that weren't working, you know, someone called me and said, I thought you were a charter school guy. I mean, in other words, you're supposed to defend the whole movement to the death no matter what. But the real reality is we're supposed to be in this for kids. So, you know, the mechanism to help kids should be always question if it's not helping kids. And and I have seen in your writing and your work, your willingness to take on those even allies. And uh, it's not really who which system or which approach is building the best mousetrap. But my goodness, is it does it remain effective throughout? I mean, you hit the nail on the head. You know, there's a tribalism associated with with this. That what, if you're a choice or charter guy, you must always be a choice or charter guy. If you're a traditional public school person, you must always be a traditional public school person. And and, and it's as if we cannot um, admit for one moment that there's a downside to the the the, the policies and practices and whatever that we favor. And, and I find that that lack of nuance. Um, not just maddening, but a little bit dishonest. Uh, I, I mean, I, for, look, for what it's worth, and maybe this is my journalism background speaking, you know, you're supposed to give a 360 picture. You're supposed to, you know, um, cover all sides, tell the complete story, and then let intelligent, thoughtful people, you know, decide. Um, but somehow, um, I guess the way to say this is that all of these, uh, uh, all of this work, whether it's practice or policy or, or research, um, has has really kind of teetered into advocacy in in too many times. And look, I'm a, I'm an unrepentant choice and charter guy. Period. Full stop. But that doesn't mean that they're perfect. It doesn't mean they're a magic bullet. It doesn't mean it's right for every single kid. And look, it really doesn't mean that we should walk away from the public school system. I I, I tell my choice friends this all the time. It's like you realize that. The vast majority of American children go to traditional public schools and probably always will. So you you cannot just wash your hands of those kids. And what you sure as heck can't do, Kevin, is root for them to fail because it advances your argument for choice. You know, that's that's a really bad idea. Talk about not doing what's right for kids. We're going to demonize. Look, I, 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 I want to be clear here. I'm not making apologies for, for second rate public schools. But the last thing any of us should be doing is kind of being gleeful when they fail kids, because those are our kids. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And to that point, let's go back to that South Bronx classroom, that school. And, and as you came out of that experience and you started to get immersed in the school choice charter school world, many of us entered the world, as I'm sure you did, 
thinking it would help engender and push and promote and, you know, lead to change in the traditional system. After 20, 25 years, uh, has it made a difference, the the choice world and the choice perspective? It's a really great question. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's certainly made a difference for certain subsets of American children, um, like all these little community responsive schools, which I'm sure, you know, they, they might be great. There's the same kind of, you know, old school entrepreneurial energy uh, about them, um, you know, that we saw, you know, with, with when, when, when Kip was starting in a church basement or whatnot, you know, 25 years ago. So, you know, that, that's, that's all well and good. But it's kind of interesting to me that, you know, when you, okay, this is going to sound cynical, forgive me, but I mean, if you think about 30 years of education reform, you know, standard standards, accountability, testing, et cetera. What do we really have to show for it? Not a lot. You know, I, I sometimes joke ruefully that that you know, 17 year old NAEP, you know, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, it looks like a dead man's EKG. I mean, it hasn't moved in, you know, since the Nixon administration, at least not, you know, not not in a way that you'd expect to see results for all of the disruption and energy that's gone uh, into into reform. So, you know, what is the one real shining star, the one thing that the ed reform movement can claim as an unalloyed victory? I think it's urban and charter schools. So have, have they made a difference? Yeah, you know, they, they have, but 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 maybe not as much as, as we would we would have liked. Interestingly, I, I you know, to, this is a long about long winded way to answer your question. I, I almost am tempted to think the jury's still out that the big difference maker has been COVID. In other words, if you if you think about what's happened the last couple of years, You've had everybody's education disrupted um, in a way that it hasn't been before. You've had the relationship that the average American has with his or her school in play in a way that it has never been before. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, one, just the simple disruption. You expect schools to be there. Um, you expect them to be open and accessible and, and, and kids' lives have been thrown into chaos for the last couple of years. Then you had the phenomenon of Zoom school where you know, I alluded to the black box of the classroom a few moments ago. Well, now that black box was, was open on your, on your laptop on the kitchen table for, for a year. So mom and dad got to see what kids were doing all day. And, you know, in some instances, that was a good reflection on, on education. And in some, sometimes it was not. Um, so you had, you know, I look for, for, for 20 years now, I've been and the guy saying, hey, can we talk about what the kids do all day? Can we talk about curriculum? Can we talk about instruction? Well, we didn't need to talk about it anymore. You could open the laptop and see it in your home. Um, so now we're talking about it for good, for good or for ill. So that's probably made, made a difference. I mean, it, when I say the jury's still out, you know, you've seen the numbers, I'm sure that I have, you know, just the number of kids who've exited the public school system. We don't really have a good sense yet of what they're doing, whether they're learning, how they're doing. Um, but as I said before, I mean, the, the, the relationship that we have with local public schools has, is now in play in a, in a way that it is, probably has not been in any of our lifetimes. The, the parent, um, the energized parent of today post-COVID, yeah, they want their kids to be academically prof proficient, but they want other things, too, that we may have missed. So speak a little bit about this, this new parent voice that isn't just looking at test scores or how we look in world rankings or the NAEP scores. Uh, but th there's other aspects of schooling that are troubling that even those who are engaged in the choice and charter movement, I think, and I'd be interested to get your opinion, seem to miss. I happen to take the parenting um, movement seriously, and not everybody in our world does. Okay? Yes. And there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, having you know been um, brushed elbows with with ostensible experts in this field, uh, you you have a bit of a crisis of confidence that maybe they don't always know what they're doing. And and while there are you know we are all stakeholders in in education, that's why we socialize the cost of it. Parents are are first among equals, and, and then we have this this thing called local control. You know, thirteen fourteen thousand school districts. Um, which are supposed to be under local control. Um, we are not intended to defer to the the expert class to just say leave your kid and we'll 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 take care of the rest. So you know parents have a say. They're not wrong to want to say. Uh, they are not wrong to challenge uh, the expertise and orthodoxies of the professional class. I mean, that's just the way we roll in this country, right? I mean, we are supposed to be self-governing, and that that extends all the way down to to, to local school boards. So I'm not dismissive at all of of 
of, of parents wanting a say and wanting to, and to being being more active and activist in, in, in school districts. Now, does that mean that they're always right? No. Uh, does that mean that the teachers are always right? No. But that we have this dynamic system um, that that, you know, in the push and pull of, of, of these various forces, something good sh should happen in the space in between. Um, or, or at the very least, it, it just simply will not do for, for educators to say, you know, just trust me and send more money. It is never going to be a bad thing when parents, um, you know, uh, get involved, get engaged and say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on in the school? Who do you think you are? Where did you get this idea that you can do X with my kid? Um, you know, I can't say strongly enough. Doesn't mean the opinions are going to be sophisticated, um, but I'm never going to be that guy who says, hey, parents, you know, just just sit down and let the pros take care of it. So the real question is, uh, how involved should parents be? What is how hands on should they be? What is what is the, the right balance? Because I do think, Robert, that not only do uh, do far too many traditional school districts miss this and are dismissive of parents. But frankly, there are a lot of choice in charter schools that sometimes just barely go extend beyond using parents as props. So what is the right balance to make sure ch uh, a parent's voices are heard on behalf of their children, particularly in this political environment? The long story short is, is I think there's a, there's a, on a, on a good day, maybe a you know, miscomprehension between parents and schools, and on a bad day, hostility. Um, and and that, is not, that is not a public school thing. I think that's an education thing. I don't have data in front of me, but I think there is data to show that, that teachers at large uh, have fairly low expectations of, of, of parents. And, and I think you know, from the re reform perspective, one of the, the real achievements of the ed reform movement is it's just become absolutely unthinkable to hold low expectations of kids of color, but we sure as hell have not given up that, that those low expectations of parents. You know, in other words, the, the soft bigotry of low expectations has not gone away. It's just found a different surface to adhere to. That's an ongoing problem. Yeah. Well, Robert, I have one last question. I really appreciate uh, your time. We could talk forever on this and, and uh, we may end up having to do that, but this is what I really want to know. Post COVID in this brave new world, where parents are up in arms, they're very focused, school board folks are on their heels, administrators, some administrators, both in the charter and the traditional school, uh, public school world are saying, we don't want to change, we're going to go back to the old normal. How can we all figure out the best way to have productive conversations so that our children benefit? What will break this log jam? Or are we in a place where uh, it just has to play itself out? If there were more predictability about what kids do all day, well, then there'd be more of a, a clearer lens through which to judge whether or not it's effective. You know, we say, well, we've got reading scores, we've got math scores for really complicated reasons that we just don't have time to go into. They're, those are imperfect measures. They don't really tell you very much about, about the quality of instruction in, in, inside. But I mean, I, I think something good can come of this mo movement where, where, you know, all the, 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 the eternal verities of education, you know, are, are in play. I mean, it's a bromide. I'm sure you know this. For decades now, people have given low marks to public education in America, but high marks to their child's school and their child's teacher. Teachers are still among the most um, trusted professions in America, but the actual numbers of Americans who say they trust the teachers has dropped a lot. So, so what I described earlier as, as being, you know, as, as this relationship as in play, well, something good could come of that if we keep our heads. In other words, if we have a moment of sobriety here where we say, okay, what, what do we want kids to get out of, out of education in America? What should they, what should they be learning? Um, you know, what, what, you know, what's ideological, what's not ideological as a, as a slight digression, Kevin, I'll say, you know, whenever people come, you know, lament that we have, we're having a moment where the culture wars have taken over schools. I kind of chuckle and think, wait a minute, have, have you ever been to a school? Do you know what we do here? You know, we, what, what we are doing here all day is, is, is 
expressing to kids what we what we what we value and what we condemn the best that has been thought and written and and whatnot that's culture i mean it is literally an institution for transmitting cultural values to children so it is not a surprise that we're arguing about these things right now it's a surprise that we haven't been arguing about them until now in the way in which we are so you know that's not going to go away nor should it go away but it does it does call on all of us to have i think a slightly more sober thoughtful please calm conversation about our expectations of, of, of American education. Yeah. And this is not just a hopeful statement. I agree with much of what you said. I do think that for all the bloodiness out there post COVID, all the angst we're going through with parents, that at the end of the day, this is the dark before the light. I really believe that uh, there will be a settling out period where we will focus on what, children need as opposed to what systems need to do better. Robert Pondicio, thank you so much for all you do. And thank you for joining us on What I Want to Know. Thanks, Kevin. I really enjoyed it. Let's do it again. Thanks for listening to What I Want to Know. Be sure to follow and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app so you can explore other episodes and dive into our discussions on the future of education and write a review of the show. I also encourage you to join the conversation and let me know what you want to know using hashtag WIWTK on social media. That's hashtag WIWTK. For more information on Stride and online education, visit stridelearning.com. I'm your host, Kevin P. Chavis. Thank you for joining What I Want to Know.